Everyone, welcome to track one, and today uh, we've got Seth speaking about React Native, so all give him a hand, please. Kia ora, nā mihi, nia kia koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. My name's Seth, and I'm going to talk to you about React Native and a little bit about the state of um, mobile development using JavaScript. So as I said, I'm Seth, you can, you can look me up. I, um, just recently started blogging about various things, my thoughts. I started blogging about, I was going to blog about technical things, but I've been on a roll just blogging about tech in general. Um, and I'm also trying to crack back into the music scene. So I'll start out with my journey with React. So my first website I ever built was in PHP. And I um, re quickly realized my Google Foo was really terrible because I built a Drupal um, 3 website when there was, in fact, Drupal 4 out, and it was just an old tutorial, but that was a good learning lesson. Um, and then I started working for a .NET shop as a, um, as a graduate, and I quickly realized no one else really um, wanted to do the JavaScript stuff, and I saw that was an awesome opportunity, and I saw it was actually quite a cool place and saw where it was going, and thought, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to jump on that and try and become the expert. And, um, and then I, I quit, for, quit for a short period, did, did Lightning Lab and did a startup, and as most good startups do, once you raise money, you've got to rebuild. Um, so I was thinking about rebuilding. We hired this, one of my friends, and he was much better at, at React than I was at Angular 1, which I built my original thing in. So I was, thought I'd just lean on his e expertise. And then I, then I sort of fell in love with React. And I'll get into why I like, like React a little bit more. But um, I never really wanted to get into mobile, partly because of the same reasons why I liked JavaScript, because I couldn't be bothered learning all the different paradigms. So the state of, of, of mobile development. So yeah, I, I didn't know Java. I don't have a Mac, so I'm not allowed to build iOS apps, apparently. Um, couldn't be bothered learning a bunch of platform-specific stuff, if I'm, if I'm honest. Um, and that's why I chose the web, really, because you could write it everywhere, super ubiquitous. Um, who really cares if the language is the best language? It's the language I can use everywhere. Um, so yeah, if you're, if you're building apps you know, back when these platforms first came out, um, Windows 10, I guess, is a bit of an outlier there because it wasn't out when those other, other platforms came out. You were doing native. And native is always going to feel better. It's always going to be more performant. And it's always going to fit the look and feel of the platform that the person chose to buy. So, you know, someone buys an iOS app because they like iOS. Someone bought Android because they like Android, or maybe because it was cheaper. Um, multiple, and then you're going to have to have multiple teams, probably. Like, you know, it's going to be quite rare that you find some master of Objective-C in iOS development, who's also an excellent Android development, developer. And if your app's of any sort of complexity, then you're probably going to have to have more than one of these mysterious people. Um, and then also, releases are going to be harder, because you know, you're going to have your iOS get app get the new features first, or the Android app get the new features first, or you've got a bug in your Android app, so it holds up your development in other areas, or you don't have enough resource, and your whole Java team quit. Um, <coughs> so. There's lots of challenges there, obviously. And the interesting thing was Facebook made React, if, if you didn't realize that, and they also made React Native in that, in, that, in that sense. And they looked at hybrid mobile apps when they first were trying to make sure that they didn't die when the mobile evolution happened. And um, apparently, they decided it wasn't performant enough. And I can, I can see why. For example, I'm pretty sure that the Westpac one app is some sort of hybrid app, and it's, it's and on my really, really crap Huawei. It's um, quite slow. And um, so you have platforms like Ionic, which is built on top of Cordova, and that's Accenture, I believe. There's, there's many different ones. And they let you use native APIs through the JavaScript bridge, but they're essentially web pages. And you're basically trying to make it look like the native platform. And if you want to make it different for each of the sites, each of the ones, you either build a different app or you, you know, conditionals and things like that, which I'll get into you can do in these other technologies as well. But um, yeah, especially on low-powered devices, they can be quite slow. And um, that might lead your users into the uncanny valley, which in aesthetics is the hypothesis that human replicas appear that appear almost but not exactly like humans, elicit feelings of eeriness in many observers. And if you extend that to user experience, I'm sure everybody's had this sort of experience where you expect a button to act like a button in real life would, or something that you would slide along, you would expect it to slide along when your hand slides, and it, and it doesn't happen. Like A good example is I tried to um, donate to the Green Party a few months ago, and they had two different buttons. And good on them, they had some sort of Ajax thing, and it was spinning, it was spinning, and I just got impatient. I clicked the other button. Turned out I donated twice. But um, 
the good sort, the good sorts they were, they immediately gave my money back when I told them about it. Um, so the response times are not quite there. And the other thing, like one, once I tried to help one of my friends out on a, I think it was an Ionic app, and it felt like to me a whole pile of glued together different technologies, and it was quite an incohesive experience. And I was like, what's this? And wh where's that thing? And, and there's a lot of there's a lot of different bits all stuck together. So that's the old busted joint. Let's talk about the new hotness. And I know you've heard this before. This is JavaScript. This is our lives. Um, but this time, I feel like it is actually a bit different. And I'm not here to say React Native is the best of these various platforms that you can do this in. Um, being obviously from a .NET shop, Xamarin's quite appealing. Um, React Native, obviously, is what I'm talking about. Native Script. I understand, haven't used it, but it, it works with Angular 2 now, so it's probably the, the closest comparison in terms, of, in terms of this. And then I understand there's this Ruby motion that I discovered when I was doing a bit of research, but wouldn't really know too much about that. But apparently you can do it in Ruby as well now. And, and one of the cool things, though, as you, as you might know, is the sort of browser wars have led to JavaScript actually being quite performant. So we've got you know, um, JavaScript Core, which is what React Native works on, and Chakra and V8, so we've got various different really high performance Java, JavaScript environments now. So why, why did I choose React Native? Partly because I already knew React, as, as I mentioned. It has a big ecosystem, and then I also feel like a lot of the, new, the newer flavors or the new frameworks kind of just took React and sort of uh, emberified or Angular 2 -ified or created a new one like Vue, and then I quite liked the way React did it, so I didn't really see why I wouldn't just stick with React. And also, I like the fact that there's no templates, which I'll get into in a little bit. So one thing I thought I'd cover is what I've seen in every React Native um, conference I've seen. They talk about learn once, write everywhere. And I think they're actually taking a dig at Microsoft there with the UWP platform, where they talk about build once, run everywhere. And they want to say, that's not what we're trying to do here. Like, I believe their ad manager app is written in React Native, and, and there's two different apps, completely two different code bases. They might share code. I don't know, know that much detail. but their idea is like, say even if you've got a Java and iOS guy, you can teach them a little bit of React. Now they're useful to build React Native apps. They're useful on the web. And you can use the same concepts and just learn the, the platform-specific things as you go. And I think their point is that if you want a truly native experience, you want to target each platform. And you don't have to either, though. And you can do conditional things. And you can, and you can um, just have different, different files for different platforms. So just quickly on, on, on my thoughts on, on um, React, because I feel like it's almost impossible to talk about React without talking about JSX and whether or not this whole separation of concerns thing is a, is a whole, whole um, terrible thing and we shouldn't do it. I feel like when you look at these different platforms you've got up here, you've got my, my, my general feeling is these, these HTML, you're putting essentially your own proprietary language into HTML. And if you're just going to write your own programming language, why not just put the HTML in your JavaScript and use JavaScript? Because it's quite a good language, and we already know how to use it, instead of having these weird star ng4 sort of situations occurring. So what's the difference between React Web and React Native? Obviously, there's going to be APIs that you're going to call that you don't have on the web or you don't have on native. But the main difference, really, when you're looking at it, you've got components in React. It's components all the way down to the turtle. And um, as you can tell, the difference is you've got divs. And you've got uh, there, and you've got views and text, and these other things. And instead of instead of classes, I've got styles. Um, yeah, sorry, style attributes. And that's the main difference. The primitives that you that you import from like, React Native are different to what you use on the web. So is it really native? So React Native is made up of native code on the plat that that comes out of the box. They've they basically wrapped a whole pile of native components for you on both Android and iOS, and there's also support for UWP, like so Windows, all the new Windows ones, and Mac OS as well, and I believe, I believe Ubuntu, but those ones are not part of the core React Native and, and their community co contributions. So your code runs on JavaScript core, which is the Safari runtime engine, so therefore on Android, the, the Hello World app will end up being 3.5 megabytes because it ships with that, um, whereas it doesn't need to on iOS. I think they did this just for consistency, and it's a lot easier for them to control the runtime environment if you don't have to run on like a billion different no, um, JavaScript environments. So um, 
one of the really cool things about it though is you can, if you've already got a bunch of apps or you're, a, you're an app shop, you could actually just wrap up these components that you already might be using in Android or iOS and you can wrap them in such a way that you can then you reuse them in React Native. You, you don't have to throw away all of your code, you don't have to rebuild your entire app in React Native, you could just give it a whirl and try this screen or this widget or this one thing and see what it's like. And the other main thing is the, the two, there's two threads on the, on the native platform. So they, they made a lot, of, a lot of, they've done a lot of fancy work to make it actually perform properly. And there's two different threads. One is for the visuals and the animations, and the other one's for the actual JavaScript that's running on your, um, the JavaScript that you write. So to summarize that, you're writing JavaScript. It's running JavaScript. It's not cross-compiling into some other language. It's running JavaScript, and then it talks to essentially in JSON objects or whatever in a, in a way that's defined or that you define, you can talk to APIs or create native components. So this is sort of a nice wee diagram of, of what it looks like and as you can see, the React components look exactly the same except one, like I said, one's got a div and one's got a view. And then you've just got React JS DOM, which is a different package which will deal with turning your state and your props and, and your um, components into their actual representations on the web page. And then it's, it's exactly the same process with the React Native. So you put a scroll view on the page, it'll turn into a scroll view on Android. When you build it for Android, that's what it will be. When you build it for iOS, that's what it will be. So they basically abstracted that away for you, which actually contrasts to the way that Xamarin does it. Xamarin, you have, still have to deal with the, nati with the native UI way of doing it, and the data binding is up to you, for example. So I haven't actually done any of this this is straight from the, um, from the docs. This is an example that they gave of how to create a toast module. So, so what, what you see there is you've got, it extends a um, base class called React Component Based Java Module, which sounds like a real terrible name, but that's okay. Um, and, then, and then you give it a name, that get name has to be there. And then that's what you'll be calling it from JavaScript. And then everything's private from there, and you can expose things. Using this, using this decorator act, react method. So they've already done a lot of the heavy lifting for you, and, and therefore it means that if you do have to drop into the native code, it's not too bad. <laughs> so how do you share code? As I mentioned, all of the code's in JavaScript unless you need to do something with the native, and the, and, and the demo I'm about to show you, I tried to use as little, of, as little as possible of other things outside of the, the, the core things just to get a good feel for what it's like and what they give you. Um, and you can use flags to check for which platform, and you can also use different file extensions, like .ios.js and .android.js, and, it, and it'll pick up those at build time and use those. So every good app starts with a problem, and I've got, I've got a serious problem. Probably the last five flights I've taken, I always screw them up. I'll be late, or I'll book a, book a flight to Tauranga and realize I'm supposed to be in um, Queenstown for a wedding of one of my best mates. So I thought I'd make a stupid little app that would like try and remind me of this, or at least I could keep track of my, my things. So I'll get into that demo. So in the background here, you're going to see this looks like um, Chrome De DevTools because it is essentially, but it's called um, React Native DevTools, or React Native Debugger, which you can get for various platforms. And I've got my Android emulator open here already, so I'll just give you a little bit of an example of my app, which is outrageously basic, and you can, you can marvel at the beauty of the terrible code as well, as the other people have said. So there's two different things going on here. In the background, we've just got our normal Gradle Android build going on over here. And then that's going to eventually install on my app. And then here we've got the React Native Packager, which is using Webpack and a bunch of other things. I think I just ruined it. Uh, yeah, so it's, it uses Webpack and runs a node server in the background. So that keeps track of, so this first step only has to happen once, installs the app on your, on your phone, and that's done the native part. Unless you want to add some new packages or add some native code, you don't have to do that part again. And then React, the React Native Packager just works just like Webpack or live reload, ri live reload your stuff back into your application. I'll just wait for one moment there while it uh, decides to install. Actually, I'll, I'll do some tap dancing and we'll just show, show you the code first. 
while it's being while it's being painful. Oh, there we go. So here we go. I'm using Firebase here just to make my life easier, and I've just got a really simple sign up form, login form here. So I'll um I'll just make up a new a new account and sign in here. And all, see all all of this stuff, although I've written it in JavaScript, is actual native components. And I've got it installed on my phone. If you want, if you don't believe me, later on. Um, so I've got this really ridiculously simple app here, where I can add flights, I can view the flights that are at risk, and I was originally going to make this actually work with notifications and whatnot, but then I realized that's just really risky and uh, time-based things. So I just created this this button here just to show you that I can I can um, tie into notifications just on a timeout here. So friendly reminder that you need to be there, and then you know just uh, I've got it. F f sorry, I didn't mean to click on that one. I've just got it flicking through a bunch of different messages there. So one of the things I did notice that is a little bit annoying is um, background tasks aren't that easy. And I think basically the guidance is either use push notifications from a server or write native background tasks. As far that, that was my understanding at this stage. Um, so that, that, was, that was another reason why I decided just to go for the simple option. But creating this notification was literally like three lines of code, or maybe, maybe four. It was, it was pretty basic. So let's have a look at let's have a look at this. So this is just a, a, a select list, and I'm, next week I'm actually going to Christchurch, and then I've got this set up so I've got a breakpoint that's going to hit, hit, so I can show you the debugging experience. Um, so if I'm going to go on Saturday, and this is just the native Android date picker, I'm going to go on Saturday at an unfortunately early time of 8:15. And then see, we just get the exact same debugging experience that you would get using um, using a web. And I get to inspect all these things. And over here, I've got my my Redux tools, which I'm gonna I can show off a little bit later. But anyone who's familiar with that would would find that quite beautiful that you can do all that. And then I'm gonna head back on uh, Monday, I believe, a little bit more reasonable time. Or Mess that up, but let's let's just keep going. So, and I, I found it was easier just to use debugger statements because you can like dig into this and find the files. I find that annoying. I do that on the web as well. Just use debuggers and use a lint linter so that it, I delete them later. So just to not um, waste my time showing you all that, I'll just log in with a user that's already um, got some. And you'll see I'm using Redux form, and you'll see. All of my actions of me updating my things will be popping over the side there as I go. So, so this is an example of a scroll view, and let's, let's just jump into the code now, and I'll show you how this works. Folder there. So, as I said, you can have different extensions. So I just created this with the absolute basic, um, basic version. There's a com um, React command line, which is what I used to run the app in the first place. And you can go React native init name of directory you want to create and create a a project and it creates out of the box an index.android.js and an index.ios.js and you could in theory make them completely different you could have a folder of ios and a, a javascript complete different apps in the same code base and then have a shared folder or you can do what i've done here and just created one app and a root component so let's have a little wee bit of a look into what that looks like so we've got my root component and all this really is doing is setting up my redux store and then having some navigation. And that, that's actually one thing I noticed is there's a lot of different options in navigation. Like out of the box, you've got this thing called Navigator. But then it looks like this is where everything's coalescing is towards React Navigation, which apparently also works in the browser as well. Um, so as you can see here, I've got a splash screen, an all screen, a main navigator, add flights, and view flights. So my splash screen, basically, all it does is just checks, like, am I logged in? If I'm not, go to auth. If I am, go to the main place. And then 
let's just have a, a little bit more of a dig into, into, say, for example, this view flights and that scroll view that you saw before. So, as I said, all you're doing is importing things from React Native, and see, I've just got the regular old React, React package, and I've got my components, and have to have React in, in scope just like in regular React. So all that's exactly the same. All that's really different is these components. And as you can see, I've got all these lifecycle things, and I've got prop types and things like that. Um, and then I've got the scroll view. And as I mentioned, styles are done a little bit differently. So you can, you can actually just put an inline style there, and it looks very much like CSS, except you don't do, just like in React, you don't do um, snake case. You've got camel, um, camel case everything. So you can also take multiple, see how here I've got the styles object, which I'm importing, and I'll show you in one minute. You can actually add multiple styles together. And like this, I wanted to have a container that was also a list, a styled like a list item. And obviously, you can make things look a lot nicer than what my app here looks like. But I didn't really see or have the time to make it look that pretty. So style sheet, style sheet is a, another thing that comes from React Native, and it just lets you build up just an object that looks like looks like CSS, essentially. And one of the really cool things they've decided to do is use the Flex implement. Like They've got their own Flex algorithm, which is sli like a slightly different one. There's like one, one or two different things, one of which is that the default layout is not row. It's, it's um, sorry, the default column direction is, is column instead of row. And that's, yeah, other than that, it's very, very similar. And it makes layout quite, quite easy. And... The final thing I wanted to show you, which I actually only discovered last night, I haven't actually looked at this tab on um, on, the, on the old D Redux tools, but after seeing all that beautiful visualization earlier today, I thought I'd just show you the guys this this because it looks cool. You can see what happened all this time that I was using that app and see the Redux state changing as I go, which is quite beautiful. I don't know how useful that is, but it looks cool. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, so that yeah, if anyone's not seen Redux before, like this stuff is quite cool. How you can sort of you can have a look at what's happened between all these different steps. You know, I can see that I've got all flights requested, which turned my is fetching to true and my has loaded to false, and then when it came back, I added my items and and all these things. So popping back to my slides here, it's not always that fun. And one of the things, ah, change my view here. Oh, it, did it, it did it itself, nice. Um, one of the things I noticed was, as you can tell, I'm on a Windows machine. And I just made everything go away there. Um, and I don't actually know because I haven't done too much Android development, but I feel like most of the issues that I would have had getting my environment running were probably because Facebook's a, a Mac organization and sort of and everyone who's doing it on Windows is sort of trying to catch up. And like, they originally made it only for iOS, for example. Um, and then the navigation I found quite confusing at first because I was like, which one of these 30 different navigation packages? And I guess that's actually a problem in all, in all ecosystems, but it's very, since it's very fresh, it's very hard to really grok which one is actually the thing that you want to go for. And then the other thing I found was, there was n there's not that many tutorials out there. So that's, so that's good and bad. I think it's good for someone like myself who wants to write things that people haven't already written about. But if you actually got stuff to do, then it can be quite, quite challenging. Um, <laughs> So yeah, um, it's not all just you know fun fun and games. It's quite fresh. I think it's like 0 0.3 point something. So it's not even got to version one yet. But I think that's actually starting to change and it's starting to get a lot less volatile. So ah, sorry guys, there wasn't really anything on that last slide though. Luckily. Cool, so that's me. <laughs> Screw you, PowerPoint. But anyway, that's the end of my presentation anyway. Does anyone have any questions? <laughs> that's as good as I'm going to get, I think. Thank you, Seth. Um, we, uh, we do have a bit of time, so has anyone got any questions? Right. That was really cool, thanks. Um, I've experimented with React Native. It's mostly been a positive experience. Mm. But I found I had to write quite a lot of device-specific code at times. Um, and 
I learned that there are some common pitfalls that I ran into. I don't know if that's something you've had a lot of experience of, of having to go if devices this, if devices that. Um, to be fair, I've, un I've basically half written an app that I was trying to trying to write, and then that's when I presented this thing. So I'm only I'm only learning the stuff myself as well. So I've tried to avoid anything that I've had to do any device specific at the moment. And what I'm building is like pro bono work, so I'm like it's just going to look the same on both devices, and I don't really care sort of approach. So unfortunately, I can't really answer you there. <laughs> and up the back. Um, yes, I didn't really demo that. Yeah, you can do that. I could. Sorry, that, um, oh, no, I don't have can the you screen. just get that one on the microphone? So he, uh, he, he asked, um, have, you, have you tried doing any of the hot reloading or live reloading stuff? And yes, I was using that. I found just like on the web, the hot reloading can be a bit hit and miss because some stuff hot reloads and some stuff doesn't. So I just ended up using live reloading, which is just like, say, browser sync. You, you save the file, it reloads the app. But then unfortunately, it'll bring you back to, say, the root the root route or whatever, whereas hot reloading would just shim in what you've got and say you've got a billion form filled in, it would, it would help you out there. But I found, every, it, I found sometimes it would just bug out on me and crash the app and I'd, it would just got frustrating, so I just let it do the live reload. But that is one of the amazing advantages of this over, say, doing it natively, that you don't have to be like stop, start, stop, start, stop, start. You just save, reload, save, reload, and it's a lot faster. Any more questions? No? Great. Can um, everyone help me give a hand to Seth?